How's it going? I'm Amar Guri, and from writing to game dev, Eddie to adorable, I'll make worlds to touch your heart. Uh, okay, that was, that, was, that was a little cheesy, but whatever. I wanted to try it out. It's fine. Uh, so it's Isaya week, and in the Isaian equivalent of their calendar, it's God's week in the north, and it is nearing the Sirius's birthday in the south. And in real life, this means I release something big and new and Isaya adjacent. Last year, I made a game called the Gemshim Impact. It's free on my itch.io. And this year, I'm releasing an art book. Uh, plus, all my games are on sale for 50% off. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty big deal. If you haven't gotten them yet, check it out. But to celebrate here on YouTube this year, I want to gush about my characters and show off all of my mid-story character designs so you can see like how they've changed since I first started drawing them. Personality-wise, I have had many prototypes for Arliss there kicking around for a while, but this Arliss there ripped off the old ones with a mix of Tehanu from the Earthsea Cycle, Violet Evergarden, and my own abandonment issues. <laughs> Though I think the highly underrated right-hand man trope like Eponine or Shigo from Kim Possible probably influenced her a little. Arlisair was born in a small fishing village before it was destroyed in a dragon storm when she was eight. House de Magnia, a mafia-like noble house known for doing whatever it takes to get what they want, took her in as a publicity stunt and she was given as a pet of sorts to the heir of House de Magnia, Gilanix. And together, they committed lots of war crimes. However, prior to the start of their story, Gil betrayed her and she had to kill him to defend herself. After his death, her home nation fell to the south, and today she lives in the south with her new adoptive father, Senator Diocaeus Praefori. Though her relationship with him is pretty strained even on the best of days. So, Arlisair formerly had terrible burn scars, but as part of her adoption, the senator gave her prosthetic magic ceramic skin. And it's been through a couple of iterations, this skin, uh, from the scarred squares to this completely smooth look. But I like this, the current iteration, which is this faintly ball-jointed doll look. It draws this really important parallel between her and the Philosopher King, who is similar to Arlisair, in that she's a girl in a position of power solely because of the men who adopted her. And I give the Northerners in Ysaia this fairly punk Viking look, uh, and despite her adoptions, she still wears her hair the same. She has taken to wearing southern wrap dresses now, partly from the heat and partly as the political statement, you know, like, the burn maiden of Thule is one of us now. This dress has been through a couple of iterations now too, but since I actually own a dress like this now, I have a much better idea of what would be practical. I kind of like that the top is impractical for her though, because southern girls tend to be larger and curvier, and Arlisair's body doesn't really fit in their styles. Right now, Arlisair is trying to figure out how to stop Eris, goddess of the abyss, from betraying Diocaeus, who seems to trust her blindly. And despite despising him for, you know, taking over her country, Arlisair relates to blindly trusting someone that you love, and so she kind of wants to save him, as well as anyone else in Eris's sights. But while that's her goal, her motivation is her craving for true love and her fear of being abandoned again. She really doesn't want to be left alone, but this means that she will drive everyone else away just so she can be in control of her own loss. So she's going to have to learn how to reconcile both these burning desires and sort of become her own person in the upcoming arcs here. Diocaeus was originally just Arden Izunia plus the tortured artist, artist archetype. I didn't actually write him alone. My DM and boyfriend, Emer's Locke, who's also a content creator, co-wrote him with me and often piloted him through his more complicated schemes. He loves Magnificent Bastards and exceedingly smart characters like Light from Death Note or Sherlock or his current favorite, Ayan Koji from Classroom of the Elite, so I think you can see where his passions lie. Daikaeus was born and raised in Telethans. He fought a war to conquer the furthest western boundary in the south, and then he went into engineering and AI. And on the basis of his engineering, as well as his charismatic smile, he was elected into the Senate before proposing and making the current Philosopher King. It has been this decade-long process for him, but she is finally in a place where she exhibits true sapience, computer-fast reflexes, and the ability to point and destroy any city. Um, but with his robot daughter's success, Diocaeus has been put in charge of conquering the uncivilized North, uh, or uncivilized North. But what no one really knows is that he had the help of an eldritch abomination, goddess the Vis Eris. So how much longer is she going to keep favoring him? How much longer can he stay in control? Diocaeus was really difficult visually. He went through so many iterations before I even liked his silhouette or palette. Um, 
I started out too stuck in Arden Izunia for a while, so he looked really scraggly, because um, Arden Izunia kind of looks scraggly, that's the point. And the black looked uh, evil, but it didn't suit his culture, where white is the primary color. Um, and white didn't feel right at the time, even though it was culturally correct. But um, everything changed when I realized that I needed to make him buff instead of frail, and I leaned into this Greco-Roman cultural roots, and so now he looks statuesque, but he still has this classic smile like a used car salesman. He can smile and smile and be a villain. Diakaeus' current goal on the webfic is to figure out what's causing the demon uprising so he can get reelected without the Inquisition figuring out his ties to Eris. By the way, if you haven't been following my web fiction, link in the doobly-doo, um, these are all characters from it. If you like serial fiction like fanfic or webtoons or light novels, The Complete World Letters of Isaiah is an ongoing dark fantasy political drama in serial format. It follows an assassin girl as she navigates the loss of her homeland and lover. If that sounds like your cup of tea, check it out. And if it doesn't, you know, you should just keep watching anyway, because my characters make me really happy and I just hope they'll inspire you too. Lucienne was my take on the classic, sexually liberated, hedonistic, manipulative femme fatale. Because I honestly really like the trope, and I just wish these sorts of girls got more actual development instead of just being crawling on the table and being pretty eye candy or whatever. Um, specifically, Lucienne is actually just a really therapeutic character for me. She's kind of a combination of all these things I'm afraid to be, like angry, petty, horny, jealous, hypocritical, selfish. Despite all of these flaws, she's just the most confident, self-assured person you've ever met. Um, and that might just sound like she's an asshole, and I would say certainly think so, but in order to be good at manipulating people, she has to understand them. And I don't really want her to abuse people, because I think that's kind of cringe, um, so I want her to just understand people and understand what people want and be able to appeal to it and then use that to get her what she wants. See, Luz was the daughter of the rival family to House of Magnia, so she and Arlisair never really got along, plus she was engaged to Gil as part of their arranged marriage, nobility does that, and then Arlisair killed her father when he tried to destroy the governments, and so, you know, he deserved it, but that doesn't make Lucian happy about it. Lucian has been in charge of House de Feltoir, and her two catty younger sisters, Celia and Derecina. Um, and at the end of the war, um, the Aftercratoria tried to disband the nobility, but Lucienne persuaded Diakaeus to give her special leeway and keep her wealth. And now she's headed south to try to get the North's independence back. Uh, visually, I struggle to draw Lucienne for years. I mean, it's hard to draw someone who's just like, you know, attractive TM and that's her main character trait. Uh, I wanted to have the 1940s classic femme fatale vibe with the dark hair, the smoky eye, and the red lip, but I also wanted her to conform to the beauty standards in the north, hence her hair being the pinnacle of beauty there, with the long braided back and the sides shaved. Uh, the thing that finally let me get her face shape right was actually stealing from Genshin Impact's like everyone in Genshin Impact has babyest baby face, but this doesn't actually stop the Genshin Impact adult characters from being pretty hot. So, this taught me that our society probably idolizes youth more than it should, but, you know, like, whatever, I'm gonna use it, I'm gonna leverage it to make my artwork work for people, you know? <laughs> Kivik was inspired by a D&D campaign I was in. It was, like, months late to start, and I would gotten so excited for this cultist character, and I, so I just imported her into my world. Uh, and she needed a flippant, hedonistic, Lucifer-esque blood god to worship, so then Kivik, uh, they became a major antagonist. I will note I picked Blood God specifically because of Technoblade, the Minecraft YouTuber, may he rest in peace, and may Technoblade never die. But specifically also the incredible renditions of Technoblade by Wolfie Witch and Sadist. Saddest? His backstory is 2,000 years ago, demons ruled the South, either directly or indirectly. And though the Seers drove them out or killed them, the few that hid and remained grew much stronger. And chief among them was Kivik, the Blood God. He and his lieutenant Vanya and the Demon Lords have been quietly trying to regather their strength and defeat the Sirius. But it is really difficult to win a fight against someone who can literally see every possible future as well as identify the most likely ones. So that's rough for him. You can see the influence of Wolfie Witch and Sadist in their design, but I was also inspired by the art of this Anmyoji character. Sorry, I don't want to play the game, I just like this particular art. Um, and he could also simply heal his scars, but he wears them as an aesthetic choice. Uh, their tattoos are a symbol of their constellation, Kivik. Um, see, all the witches in the South have these 14 constellations that they use as kind of like tarot symbols or astrology 
constellations like the, what we have with Virgos and Libras and stuff. Um, so this is his constellation slash sigil. And Kivik today is typically recognized by witches as the burned man for his self-sacrifice, but Kivik will tell you that's a bastardization of his original story. I really like these sorts of overlaps and discrepancies in history, so I wanted to include that in his story in that the modern take on him is wrong, kind of, and the older, this older regional version of him being a blood god is more correct. Kivik's primary motivation is his desire not to be defeated because he wants to achieve what he believes is his rightful place as a godling. He thinks he's owed that, and so he's going to take it if he has to. I adore King Arthur stories. Also, I love modern riffs on King Arthur. I love all of Heather Dale's music. I love Saber from the Fate series. I love Once and Future King by T.H. White, I liked the Merlin series, you know, all the stuff. And so Rhea was one of my first characters that I developed for this world, and I was actually inspired to make him and all the other heroes under the mountain in my world um, this whole wide world theme from uh, the overly sarcastic production video suggesting that a story with a bunch of the kings of the mountain returning at the same time would be really cool. And initially, I was like, I want this to be this HBO style show where King Arthur and all the other kings of the mountain return in the wake of the destruction of North America in a nuclear crisis, but I don't personally like writing contemporary stuff even if I like, you know, I like it in other contexts or I like watching other people's contemporary stuff. And so then I said it in my own fantasy world. My friend Jay said something actually super insightful at the time that made me do this. She said, what we do in the shadows, which is this great comedy about vampires living in New Zealand, um, has been made like three different times. All the same jokes, but the execution just keeps getting better. And I was like, you know what? I can come back to this if I want to. If I ever want to come back and make it this modern HBO style script, I can. But if I don't want to, I can, you know, just leave it here, make it, make it my own thing, do whatever I want with it. So I was just inspired by that to just go for it instead of waiting for the right time. Rhea's story is basically the King Arthur story with elements from Finn McCool and Cuchulain. Um, like, he was born to this fierce seal lady and supposedly a dragon. He was a natural-born sage, meaning that he can see magic. And he pulled a sword out from Anvil in a previous king's trial hall, which is this puzzle box-like grave site that is used to test for who should be the next king. And then he grew up and he married a fae named Sithak. But she vanished one day and left him alone with their son, who came to resent his father's poor and idealistic rule of their empire. So they fought to the death, and. Only then did Sithak return to save her husband, where she put him to sleep until Thule needed him most. But with the war lost, does Thule really need its long-lost emperor? Rhea, so visually, was inspired by all this fan art from League of Legends and Overwatch characters and Pinterest, along with these really pretty pho photographs of people being, air quotes, Vikings. I assume, anyway, I don't know, maybe they're actually Norse, but I love the way they look. And Previously, I had him have more spiky hair, but as I've learned more about black representation in, at the very least, United States culture, I learned it's not that common to let black people just have their natural hair. So with the encouragement of my arch buddy, Tarlachan, um, he now has gold-tipped locks, I think they're called. Rhea's current goal is to protect the interests of Thule in this post-war transition, but he's motivated by his desire for purpose and his uncertainty about who he is and what role he needs to play now. In contrast to Riev, I made a philosopher king. So Calliopeia is inspired by nukes and World War II because I wanted that nuclear war urge of destruction of the world thing, so she has these powers that can destroy entire cities. Um, but I was also inspired by modern reinterpretations of the Gollum story, the Gollum being um, Jewish folklore, and also sort of the way that the Gollum story has been reinterpreted interpreted through Frankenstein and really inspired by uncertain rulers who are trying to do their best but don't always know what's best to do. And a lot of my friends, incidentally, uh, like to call me a robot because I'll do really weirdly mechanical things and it doesn't make sense to them because I'll just like do the thing that makes logical sense but doesn't actually make sense if you look at it or something. I don't know. I don't feel like I understand people as well as I should sometimes. But anyway, so with all, I sort of mixed all those elements together and that's who Calliopeia is. The previous version of the Philosopher King died 400 years ago. They had to disassemble him because he went on this crazy rampage after this human he fell in love with rejected him. And so they rebuilt Calliopeia as a child who wouldn't develop these deep romantic feelings. 
Uh, she was originally made to be vaguely androgynous by a diacaeus, as I mentioned, because their god, Yeus, is seen as a genderless figure. I mean, it's god in all of the world and good and evil and perfection and stuff like that's beyond gender. And she decided, however, that she wanted to be seen as a princess. And so she had her ceramic skin refitted to match this new image of herself to make her look more feminine. And she's taken to wearing all these lacy white dresses and these really elaborate wigs. Now she's this beautiful, delicate princess who nonetheless can nuke people. So she was really difficult to design and draw for the same reason as Lucienne, because she's supposed to be dainty and doll-like and awe-inspiringly beautiful. But now, after years of watching doll face-up videos on YouTube and ball joint doll customization, I've had a lot more inspo for how to draw her. So um, also I got a lot of assistance from outside artists who did renditions of her until I finally figured it out. So thanks again to all my lovely artist buddies. She is primarily motivated by self-preservation because she was programmed to do whatever it takes to not be disassembled. And for her, that means protecting her people and leading effectively. Otherwise, she'll be dis disassembled because she's a waste of state resources. But increasingly, she fears she's going to have to protect them from her own beloved father, Diacaeus, due to his connections with Eris. Okay, so you know that blue-haired anime girl in a white dress who dances and sings and is super nice and probably knows more than she's letting on? No, the other one. <laughs> That's who Yulia is inspired by. So Yulia has been on all my world since I was like 12, and every time I include her, I find a new way to riff off my last work. I have a bunch of characters like that, actually. Characters who are reactions to my previous work, but are fundamentally the same. Arlis is one of them, too. I know that sounds a little uninspired, but I think some artists are just drawn to the same ideas again and again. Like, look at every feisty ponytail girl in a Ghibli movie. So this incarnation of Yulia got some new influences from Tira Marone from Eberron, and very recently from Kushida from Classroom of the Elite. Though, to be clear, I've never read Classroom of the Elite. Um, I just play opposite a D&D character based off of her. So all my Yulias have been able to see the future in some way, but her exact role in the story and in society has changed with each world. I've had a series of worlds. This is my 12th one. And in this world, I call her my Kaguya Jesus. She was born on the sea foam into a child with Tsar and Tsarina. She was a quiet child who grew up to lead her people through disaster after disaster, working miracles and speaking in riddles. And she sent the dragons away to the upper continent when they started wreaking havoc, but she was slain by the demon king. And then Dias themselves was said to be so sorrowful that they reincarnated her. So she is said to be both Dias and Dias' daughter, kind of like Jesus. Visually, well, she's, you know, a wispy anime girl with long blue hair and a white dress. And she, once again, was a struggle because she's supposed to be beautiful, TM. Oh my god. That's my rabbit. Hang on. Excuse me, Hestra. Sorry about that. That was super unprofessional about me. Yulia was once again a struggle because she's supposed to be, like, beautiful TM, and that's really hard. Um, but as usual, I handed her design off to other people, and then I finally figured out what I was doing with her. Once again, drawing off of my knowledge of Genshin character impact design. Currently, Yulia is trying to keep her sister in check and keep her sister from destroying the world. While she's partially motivated by altruism, she genuinely wants what's best for human beings. What is best for human beings also inevitably benefits her because Dies is the god of interconnectedness. So the more humans are interconnected and are not trying to kill each other, the better off she is. Lastly, but certainly not least, Eris is a character I have struggled to write for a while. Uh, this whole time, my lovely goddess of the abyss has been this wily, slightly unhinged girl. Um, she is the oldest of all the gods' avatars, or as I like to call them, human sonas. Uh, initially, I had her as this sort of rip-off Junko Enoshima from Danganronpa, but recently, after seeing Arcane, she's now adopted some more Jinx elements, and I think that now that I've been writing her a little bit more, she's t stepped a couple more steps away from both of them and kind of is her own person. I don't know, she's the character I think I'm the least certain about, but I still love her. She's so cool, she's so quirky, she blows things up, she has like a thousand eyes, it's great. So she is the godling of the abyss, and she doesn't really understand humans, nor is she interested in them. But she sees the joy that her sister, Yulia, gets out of protecting them and interacting with them, and she's like, well, they, she can't actually like interacting with them. And I think in her heart, she's jealous and lonely of her sister and insecure because she doesn't know how to ask for what she wants, nor is she willing to meet humans on their own terms. 
Plus, she gets joy out of watching them struggle so hard to rise to the top of the world, and she also likes to watch people at the top of the world lose everything in a dramatic fall. So, you know, she's not gonna be making any friends genuinely anytime soon. Visually, Eris is designed to look opposite of her sister, whose pastel blue hair is contrasted by Eris' Stygian blue hair and silvery skin. Stygian blue, by the way, is one of those quote-unquote forbidden colors. Obviously, her hair isn't actually that color. I mean, you can't draw that color. That's not how it works. It's uh, one of those colors where if you look at a really yellow light and then close your eyes, you see a certain color of blue. So it's an imagined hue of blue. So I've tried to replicate it that as best as I can. Um, with her hair. That's the color of hair I describe it, the way I describe it in my writing, anyway. And then her true form here takes inspiration from Cthulhu art and jellyfish and Chinese traditional clothing, you know, the big hat, as well as Ursula from Disney with her, like, tentacle skirt or many, many eyes. I wanted her to look really unsettling while still looking beautiful. More than anything at this point, I think Eris just wants to be loved. And if you show her that love, she'll grant you power unlike anything you've ever seen on Earth. So smash that like button for Eldritch Knowledge! Okay, thanks for listening to me gush about my characters. Remember, art book in the description, 50% off of games this week, and my web frick is free, so check them out. Ooh.